Maria Leah Carter, who is the Associate Professor in Natural Language Processing, NLP, at Queen Mary University of London, and obviously a Turing Fellow, is going to be talking about longitudinal modelling of changes in individual language. So using natural language processing to look at changes in individual language. So maybe I'll find out why I use different words depending on who I'm hanging out with. Maria, over to you. Uh, great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Just a, a small change. I'm, I'm full professor, thanks to having got this fellowship and having moved to Queen Mary. <laughs> um, so I'm very excited to be presenting at the Accenture Turing Innovation Symposium. And what I will be presenting to you is based on my EPSRC UQRI Turing AI Fellowship on creating time-sensitive sensors from user-generated language and heterogeneous content. And I'll explain what this is, but I'll first say a few things about the broad area I'm working in, natural language processing. So natural language processing, uh, can you move to the next slide? So the, yeah. Thank you. So natural language processing is the field that studies computational methods for getting computers to perform useful tasks involving human language and also identifying structure and text. And it's also concerned with the insights that such computational work gives us into human processing of language. And methodologically, there are important overlaps with machine learning, even though in early days, um, NLP involved rule-based systems and grammar creation. But it's also more than machine learning, as in, it involves human knowledge and how we represent it, as well as common sense reasoning. And we've achieved a lot of things in NLP in recent years. We've made big advantage in text classification and hard problems such as machine translation, question answering, summarization. But there are quite a few challenges remaining. So uh, the first of these is uh, working with small data and transfer learning across domains. So going, for example, from um, models trained on a news domain to the health domain obtaining useful and interpretable representations. So at the moment, a lot of the representations we use are quite opaque to uh, these, these kind of vector representations we use are, are quite opaque. Uh, there's the issue of mitigating bias in language models and improving the collaborative human machine process. So how, how you can actually have systems that work better dynamically. Uh, for example, you can, you can um, uh, think about a system where that summarizes data for a clinician, the clinician makes notes, and then the, the system takes this into account and improves the way it's doing the summarization. And there's also resolving complex linguistic phenomena such as bridging and ellipsis. So um, all of these are important challenges within natural language processing and the work that um, we are undertaking in this uh, fellowship is covers at least uh, these first four topics. So um, ne next, sorry, next slide, and then next slide. <laughs> um, we uh, a big premise of this work involves leveraging user generated content. So, what is user generated? content, user-generated content. So as individuals, we produce large amounts of digital content. This is, uh, this can be textual data and social media, but also language and other data from devices such as mobile phones, fitness devices, and so on. And this all constitutes what we call heterogeneous user-generated content. And all of this data contains behavioral cues. Next slide, please. And through this fellowship, we want to leverage these, this user-generated content and establish a new area within natural language processing on personalized longitudinal language processing. Uh, we want to develop sensors for capturing digital biomarkers from language and heterogeneous user-generated content to understand the progression of an individual over time. And we want to apply this technology that we develop uh, and make a significant contribution, especially to mental health, but by creating new tools based on the sensors 
which would make it possible to assess and measure conditions in between clinician appointments. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so why uh, are we interested in particular uh, in this work? Uh, why, why is it important? Uh, because the methods we propose and the resulting sentence can have a wide range of applications, uh, uh, but also, importantly, it can help us address the, the gap that we have in terms of um, understanding, better understanding of mental health conditions. And this is particularly important as, according to the World, the World Economic Forum, mental health disease accounts for 35% of lost work output, which is twice as much as cancer and more than cardiovascular disease. And there's also work at the, at the intersection of NLP and mental health that shows that signals for the diagnosis of certain conditions can be found in language. And increasingly, the clinical community are looking for new and better diagnostic measures and condition monitoring tools, as well as ways to help with sort of the lack of resources available uh, for, for sort of the kind of face-to-face um, -face interaction, as we're finding also in the current pandemic. The next slide, please. So um, by creating sensors that capture digital biomarkers from language and user-generated content, we can employ them as the basis for new clinical assessment tools. And these sensors could also help online platforms with post and user moderation activities to better protect vulnerable individuals, which is also in line with the objectives of the recent online harms white paper. Next slide, please. Um, we have two particular use cases in mind of the proposed technology. One is identifying changes in cognition and the other one in mood instability. Next slide, please. So what we mean by that, so for example, the case on cognition, imagine that your computer has an application that allows it to track changes in your language use over time and is able to present to you or people of your choice with evidence that there is a sustained change in your linguistic ability. And next slide, please. Or that you have bipolar disorder and your PC or device can tell you that a manic or depressive phase is coming up. So these are some example use cases here. Uh, next slide, please. So, oh, sorry. Uh, previous slide. Previous slide. There we go. So, uh, what are some of the challenges in developing these kinds of time sensors from language that I'm talking about? So, one is is how we actually represent this this kind of content. How we represent an individual through this kind of content. So we need to find ways of representing the individual through both the language and other content where the different streams may be asynchronous. So that's uh, work currently in progress. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another important goal is to address sparsity in real world longitudinal data sets while respecting ethical, re while respecting ethical issues. Uh, there aren't many longitudinal data sets where there's uh, ground truth. And what I mean by ground truth is labels, for example, about diagnosis and mental health. But we're in a good position for this as we've been working on the creation of such data sets in past projects. And we're working both with small, fine grained data sets, uh, as well as large data sets from social media. Next slide, please. And um, as these data sets are all sensitive, we keep them in a safe environment. And uh, only after anonymization uh, uh, and de-identification de do we actually work with them uh, on more regular um, analysis environments. Uh, at the moment, all of the processing we do is within the, the Turing uh, environment. Uh, we are adding annotations to these data sets, but are also working on generating synthetic data on the basis uh, of the data sets. And we have also obtained um, some additional funding to port the models that we're developing in the project to uh, more data sets as well, 
and I can say more about this if people are interested. So there'll be a, um, a hackathon uh, on this quite soon and this will also feed into uh, a shared task for um, a workshop coming on, up next year. Um, next slide, please. And um, one of the important, one, one of the other important challenges is how we actually determine changes and um, and, and, and baselines for individuals. So uh, it's this challenge of identifying personalized moments of change. And we're currently working on methods for capturing both discrete changes, but also ranges of changes. And I can also say more about this if there are questions. Um, and uh, another challenge is actually working on a real world evaluation setting where apart from working with real world data, so the data sets that we do have are from um, actually from real individuals and um, then of course we'll, we'll have the synthetic data as well, but the main thing is to also have a real world evaluation setting where we co-create with stakeholders and at the moment we have stakeholders who include clinicians uh, but also uh, platforms, online platforms. And we also want to be able to create interpretable summaries to summarize user changes over time and why these happen. Uh, so finally, the, the project will de deliver uh, on a number of different aspects. So uh, new methods for personalized longitudinal natural language processing, uh, methods for synthetic data generation, methods for longitudinal predictions, tasks and methods for longitudinal predictions, and personalized change points. Uh, we want to uh, release software uh, on implementing time-sensitive sensors from the uh, heterogeneous user-generated content, co-creating new instruments for diagnosis and monitoring of, of mood and cognition based on the sensors, and generate impact both through publications, workshops, and public engagement, and, and the engagement, of course, with our stakeholders. So uh, thank you very much. I think I forgot to tell you to advance the slides several times there. Um, yes, sorry. I, I thought um, I had discussed this uh, a bit earlier and I thought it would be possible to pick up if I forgot to give the cue. Uh, next slide as well, please. Um, I think we can leave it there, yeah. Great, thank you very much, Professor Leah Carter, Professor. Professor. Uh, that was that was fascinating and much more in depth and important than uh, than what I was joking about at the start. We have a number of questions in already, some quite specific and some general. So I'm going to start with uh, a couple of specific ones. Uh, one which I thought was interesting and quite technical is how will the technology cope with different languages and dialects, especially ones that are not very common, where you don't have many speakers. Of a, of a language or users of a dialect. So, so there's a lot of work being done at the moment on uh, working with low resource languages and how you basically port models that have been trained on languages such as English, which typically have a lot more um, models and, and also data sets um, to the less resource languages and I, and I think that's a kind of a general problem not just for for this particular project uh, and and there's different ways of that people are looking at doing this uh, it, we're in a much better positions position at this point in time than we were uh, five or ten years ago to to do this kind of thing because the the kind of models we're working with are creating these latent representations which are sort of ca capturing meaning across uh, sort of in a semantic space, which is supposed to be, um, I guess, representative across languages. So we're so people are looking at at ways of aligning kind of the uh, the semantic spaces from different languages, and so you can. Uh, so this is not not just for our work, but more generally, your your kind of you've got a model that you've trained. Uh, in, the, in the high resource language and you try and find similarities between the two languages to essentially 
uh, tweak your model. And of course, that depends. It's sort of more easier in the in the um, in, in closely related languages. So, for example, languages uh, French and English are, are much more closely related than, than, for example, Hebrew and English. So you can essentially use modeling trained on the big data sets and it will work with the, the smaller data set. Yes, I mean, th this is sort of something that, that you still 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 is, is sort of a big area of research, but, but it's, we're in a better place to do this that, than we were several, week, several years ago. <laughs> several weeks ago. So probably, and it's probably several weeks of such a fast moving <laughs> through. <laughs> uh, and another question, which in a way is technical, but I think in a way perhaps gets to the philosophical heart of what you're doing, is how how can the tech distinguish between temporary mood fluctuations? So it's just like I'm having a bad day, and something that is indicative of a longer term mental health problem, such as depression. Is is that a is that a machine learning issue? Is that a, something that clinicians can do? So, so what we're trying to capture here in, in the work that we've been doing so far is to, um, to, to try and capture changes that are um, switches and sort of typically have a, a, a smaller duration and also escalations. And um, I guess the also kind of... Um, being able to identify someone's baseline. So, so if someone typically uh, has a lot of switches and a lot of escalations, uh, in they, you know, that that's that's more of a sign that you know maybe this is what they're like as a as a person. Uh, but if you know you have periods where um, you know you don't have such uh, such, such switches, such, such changes in mood, then that's more indicative that something is happening that is not um, that, that that is diverges from the baseline of this user. So that's uh, of, where, uh, sorry, yeah. that's where the personalization comes in that you're you're trying yes. to establish what's normal for them rather than what's normal for the whole population. Yes. So we are working with uh, the, so the models we are training are on longitudinal data from the same individuals and then uh, testing on individuals who we haven't seen but uh, so so you're trying to so you're training uh, I mean ideally if you could you could basically train on the data of just one individual but what you do is your model trains on it's it looks at, at the longitudinal data of many individuals uh, but then it's it sort of tries to have having learned this for a population of people it tries to then uh, map what it's learned to the longitudinal data of, of an individual. Does that, does that clarify things? Yes, yes, very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, there's one quite broad question. Uh, I don't know how many more we have time for, but I, I, I'd love to hear what you do take on this. Is I mean, it's amazing technology, but how can we ensure that it's used for good? and not that someone takes the same technology and, for example, uses it to detect dissident behaviour. How, how can you... How can yeah, you this, this is a very important question. And, and so we're uh, aware that uh, we, we um, have to be careful about how we share our models and, and our data. Uh, so, uh, I mean, one, one thing is I don't think we're going to be sharing any data that's not synthetic. So that's one of the, the reasons that we are also investing in this project in the synthetic data generation. Uh, and indeed also models probably trained on synthetic data as well. So that's kind of going to be protecting individuals' identity. But also I think we need to work uh, with, you know, who is, so when, how we share this uh, is, May, may have some a model of where we sort of ask individuals to say how they plan to use um, the the you know the, the, the source code that we make available. So so it's it's um, it's something that we're working out uh, with uh, with advisors both from um, legal teams and ethics uh, people who we have um, we have great people at the Turing on this. Uh, we, we want to work out a model of, you know, how is it best to kind of share this kind of code and models so that it's not, it's, we, we, we don't, um, we don't risk it being misused. 
So you're demonstrating exactly why it's so great to have something like the Turing and these partnerships, because you do have access to these ethical and legal and other teams working on related issues so that you can share your thoughts and what you learn and your best practice on this. Uh, I'm sorry, there are a few more questions in, but I am going to have to move on to the next speaker. So apologies if we didn't get to your question. Perhaps perhaps you can contact Professor Le Carter directly. If we, some of them were quite technical and specific. So do, is that all right if people get in touch? Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. And I'm also, I mean, we, we would be interested in, in other potential stakeholders who would like to share data with us or collaborate with us. We're very open to this. Uh, and and so I would be very happy to be contacted. Brilliant. Well, there you are. It's an open invitation to, to get in touch. Thank you very much, Maria.